Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final virtual guest joining Camp Easter Seals. Melanie was born and raised in Oakville, Ontario. At five years old, she began her athletic career in wheelchair racing with the Burlington Disabled Sports Association, now known as the Golden Horseshoe Disabled Sports Association. At such a young age, she had high, high hopes and dreams of representing Team Canada at the Paralympic Games one day. Little did she know how bright her future would be. Unfortunately, due to an unexpected surgery in 2012, she was forced to take a break and that dream was put on hold. It was during that break that she began playing wheelchair basketball with the Burlington Vipers. In 2014, she went on to play for the senior women's national team where she played her first major game in the world championships and got gold. Then in 2015, she played at the Para Pan Am games and got silver. In 2016, her dream came true and she went to the Paralympics in Rio. It's my honor to introduce someone who has always been an inspiration to me and many others. Introducing one of my closest friends, Melanie Houghton. Hi everybody. So Melanie, I have a question for you then I'm gonna pass it over to Haley who has questions for, from the campers. My question is, everyone will wanna know, how did you become involved with Easter Seals? Yeah, so um, when I was uh, born, uh, in 1988, that gives away my age, but um, yeah, my parents uh, found out that I'd be born with spina bifida and, um, you know, through like doctor's visits and um, getting to know like the uh, disabled community, uh, we were put in touch with Easter Seals and um, I started going to um, originally a, a family camp and then it um, evolved into um, just myself going to uh, Easter Seals camps. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Melanie. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to move on to questions that I have for you and campers. If you, while I'm asking these questions, if you can type your questions in the YouTube chat, I'll get to those after I'm done these questions. So the first question I have for you, Melanie, is so I think it's very clear that you're a superstar athlete. Did you always know that a career in sports was something you wanted? What made you decide to pursue a career in wheelchair basketball? Yeah, so um, like as Cheryl was saying, when she was introducing me, um, I started out at the young age of five. Um, so once again, um, my parents were approached um, by coaches of Burlington Disabled Sports Association. And um, so at the age of five, I was introduced to track and field. Um, and it started out, you know, just um, socializing, getting to know um, other individuals with disabilities um, and their families. Um, and then it gradually um, became something that I wanted to pursue competitively. And it, like Cheryl was saying, um, it evolved into um, me switching to wheelchair basketball um, after my surgery um, in 2012. Um, it took a whole year to um, figure out, you know, what was going on with the surgery um, and the complications that came along with that. And Burlington Disabled Sports, Golden Horseshoe Disabled Sports now, um, offered basketball. So that's how I um, got involved with basketball. Uh, and no, I was not always wanting to play basketball. That's, I never thought that I would be representing Canada um, for wheelchair basketball. Um, so yeah, that's how I got involved. And um, yeah, it was quite the shock to me that um, my path, I went down this way, but I'm so glad that it did. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a passion for sports from such a young age, but it took you yes. a while to find your way in wheelchair basketball. Yes. My next question for you is, what is the biggest obstacle you have faced throughout your career and how did you overcome it? Okay, so that's um, this past year. Um, well, for the past two years, I've been dealing with a shoulder injury. Um, started out with an injury. Um, and this past um, October, I had uh, finally had surgery for my shoulder injury. Um, so I'm actually still in the process of um, returning to play. Um, and then since, um, you know, all the things that are going on in the world, um, that has kind of been um, not put on hold, but the process looks a little bit different. So um, I haven't actually been able to play with my teammates yet, um, even though I've been clear to do that for the past five months. Um, yeah, so that has been the biggest obstacle that I have ever faced um, in my career. Um, and I am overcoming it um, because I have support of the community and my family and my friends. Um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you have wonderful 
you have a wonderful support system that has helped you through it. Yes, absolutely. And that's so important. It is, yes. My next question for you is what is it like being part of the women's national team and how cool is it to go to the Olympics? It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. The last part is what has been the biggest highlight of your career so far? Um, I will start with the biggest highlight for me. Everyone seems to pick like one part of um, an event or something like that yeah. that would stick out to them. I, I can't pinpoint one moment because they're all so important to me um, and it's made me who I am. Uh, mm -hmm. So I say the moment that I was selected for the women's national team is the biggest moment of my career. And it will always be the biggest moment of my career because um, if those coaches didn't select me to the team, I wouldn't have experienced any of these major games or anything along the way. Yeah, it really opened up the door for you for all the other experiences to follow. Yes. So it's, it always holds a special place. Um, in my heart, um, being given that, that first opportunity to um, be a part of the women's national team. Yeah, that must have been such a special day for you and your friends and family to celebrate. It was, it was, it was strange because um, like I said, I wasn't expecting to be um, playing on a national team for wheelchair basketball. Um, but once they gave me that opportunity, I came home and I was like, I made the decision that this was going to be my sport. Um, I was hoping to go back to uh, track. Um, mm -hmm. But after they gave me that opportunity, um, it wasn't even a question. I was like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah. My next question for you is who is your biggest role model and how have they helped you get to where you are today? So I do, you'll see that in my profiles that Chantal Petitclair has played a major part um, in uh, you know, how, how I perceive sport, how I perceive women in sport, um, huge role model for, for everybody, um, amazing Canadian athlete. Um, but I, I also have to say that um, anybody that I've ever competed against um, in track, in basketball, my own teammates, they all bring something um, to the world of sport. And um, it, it also goes beyond sport. Um, so I can't choose one person because I believe that everybody that you meet, um, that you cross paths with, they have an influence on um, the way that you um, live your life, the, the way that um, you, know, you go about your daily life, the things that you believe in. I think everybody plays a part in that. Yeah, that takes a lot of people. It does. <laughs> so my next question for you is what advice do you have for young athletes or for someone just getting into wheelchair basketball? I would honestly say have fun because sport can very quickly turn into um, something that is, um, you know, very serious and you start to feel the outside pressures um, in society um, or pressures, um, you know, within your own community. Um, so I would honestly just say, you know, find your passion and, and have fun. Yeah, that's wonderful advice for our young campers looking to get into a career in sports. Mm -hmm. Campers, I'm on to the final question that I have. So if you can type your questions in the YouTube chat while we're talking and I'll move on to your questions next. So my final question is, are you still training? If so, how has COVID affected your training? And when you're not on the court, what are you doing? Uh, yes, so I am, I, I am still training. Um, so like I said, I had been recovering from a surgery. Um, so Obviously, since um, COVID, you know, training has looked different, um, but everybody's world right now looks different, um, but you just have to find ways to adapt, um, you know, and I, and I believe, you know, Easter Seals are teaching you at camp on, you know, people with disabilities, um, learning how to adapt. 
to to your environment to to things that you're doing the activities that you're doing so that's that's all we're doing as as athletes is we're adapting in the environment that we're given so for example training um you know in my small apartment um in in toronto or you know coming back to oakville to stay with my parents for a little bit to have a little bit bigger space to train in um but also making sure that it's a safe environment is has been so so important uh for all of my teammates and myself. Yeah, COVID has really taught a lot of people how to be adaptable. For sure. And adapt to a variety of situations. I'm glad that you have been able to adapt your training to do it like in yes. your apartment, as you said. Yeah. We have some questions coming in for from our campers. Our first one is from Katie and she's asking, how did you get into sports? Yeah, so I, first of all, hi, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so I got into sports um, because my mom was approached um, by a lady that she worked with um, that happened to be one of the coaches for the Burlington Disabled Sports. Um, and she wanted my mom to bring me out uh, to the sports night, which was always Monday nights. Um, and it started from there. That's really cool that your mom's friend brought you into it and then you were able to find such a passion in sports that it turned into a career for you. Yes. Our next question is from Sarah and she says, what was one of the highlights in your basketball career? One of the highlights, like I said, will always be um, being named to the national team. Um, I, can, I can say also um, my first um, international tournament, which is was held actually um, in Toronto was the Women's World Championships in 2014. Um, so it was special because my family had never seen me play basketball before. And yeah. um, it just so happened that our World Championships was in Toronto. And I had such a major, major um, support system. So many people tuned in, they came to watch me. And it was really surreal to to see people while you're playing on the court and you look up in the stands and you see faces that you know there to support you it's unbelievable yeah and that's so special that your yeah. first international competition was in Toronto and your family and friends and other loved ones could come to support you in person yes I just want to quickly add that um you know my teammates explained to me that they had been playing wheelchair basketball for um, 12 years plus and that they had never played a game on home soil so wow. yeah so it really struck me as like wow I, I should really um, absorb this experience because that may never happen again yeah have you had the opportunity to play back on home soil for an international competition I have been the luckiest person because 2014 was the Women's World Championships and 2015 was the Para Pan Am Games, which was also hosted in Toronto. Um, oh, cool. So back to back, I got to play on home soil. Yeah. Wow. That's so special. Yes. So our next question is from Katie and she says, how long have you been playing wheelchair basketball? Um, I've been playing wheelchair basketball since... Um, I got selected in 2013, um, the, the end of 2013, um, for, uh, that was my first year as just a development player. My first year um, playing on the senior women's national team was 2014, which was the year of the um, Women's World Championships. Yeah. So it sounds like you really got in at a good time to be able to play two years the, in Toronto. Yeah, absolutely. Our next question is from Sarah and she's asking, what is your advice to young adults slash children living with physical disabilities who don't succeed at first? You know what, I think that not, I think it's a misconception that people are just gonna go out there and just be successful right away. I think that we, and especially as an athlete, we have the, um, the ability and we have the, um, the opportunity to let people really know that success doesn't come just like that. It's, it's not like that. That's, you know, that may be some people's experience. Um, but honestly, the majority of people, 
you know, you have to go through so many you know, trials and um, errors and um, failures, if you want to say that. Um, I, I view failures as just um, a, a learning curve. Um, without failure, you know, you don't have success. So just every time that you feel like you, you're failing at something, you have to view that as a stepping stone as to get to your, your ultimate goal. And uh, yeah, so I would just say to them, um, please don't give up. Please just keep, you know, adjusting your goals, little goals here and there. You can make adjustments um, to reach your ultimate goal. Yeah, that's such wonderful advice for our campers. No matter what like, field you're in or what's going on in your life, you never yeah. reach success without some type of failure or obstacle getting in your way. And then yeah. it almost makes the success so much more fulfilling that you've had to work really hard to get there. For sure, for sure, yeah. Our next question is from Lucas and he's asking, did you have a favorite program area while you were a camper at Easter Seals camp? Do you have a memorable occasion while attending Easter Seals camp? For me, I always love to get to know people. Um, that's, I, I, I've always loved people and um, just to get to know new people. Um, so I'm not going to say specifically, um, an activity because, um, I, I don't think, you know, so it's like socializing, it, it, socializing is not a specific activity, yeah. but that's a byproduct of what the camp brings to people. It's a sense of community. It's a sense of, you know, getting to know, um, people, um, with similar or different disabilities and, and abilities. Um, yeah. So my favorite part was getting to know new people and, and what they're doing. Yeah, that's such a special part of camp. And I think a lot of our campers would agree with you that the socialization is one of the best parts of camp that people look forward to all year. For sure. Our next question is from Sarah and she's asking, what was the one thing you wished you knew when you started basketball that you know now? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think that um, it's believing in myself believe in what I'm capable of doing, um, trust myself, trust that, um, you know, uh, I'm capable of reaching my dreams of being a Paralympic athlete. Um, yeah, and not, not having so much doubt in um, what I'm capable of accomplishing. Yeah. And our next question is a repeat question, but Maybe okay. Leon wasn't on when you first answered it. And he's asking again, how long have you been playing wheelchair basketball? Um, yeah, so I started, um, I'll say the first, um, the first time I was uh, on the national team, women's national team is uh, in 2014. Um, the previous year, 2013, um, I was just on the development team. And then our next question is from Arta. And they're asking, what's something about your, what's something that your career has shown you? And do you have any goals for the future? Um, my career, I think, and sport in general teaches you so much in, in life. Um, it's way more than just a game to me. Um, it teaches you um, morals. Uh, it teaches you uh, a sense of community. Uh, the importance of community and also a sense of um, importance to give back um, after the successes that I've experienced in sport. Um, I feel the obligation uh, to um, give back in the community and that's what it has shown me. Yeah, sports has so many life lessons that you learn from partaking. So many. Yeah, I could talk, I can talk for hours what it's, you know, brought to my life. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll put out a final call for campers to ask your questions in the YouTube chat. And while they're thinking of their final questions, I wanted to ask, what's next for you? So what are your plans for the future? Yeah, so my plans for the future is to um, get back on the court, um, you know, properly with my team and um, you know, kind of see where I'm at. And um, I think everybody is aware that the Olympics and the Paralympics um, got put on hold um, because of the COVID. 
Um, so hopefully that will still be a go ahead for uh, 2021 now. Um, so uh, that's my goal is to make the um, women's national team for uh, Tokyo 2021 now. Cool. And a common question that hasn't been asked yet that our campers usually ask, so I'll okay. ask it, is what does a typical day in your life look like when you're training? Um, so even during like this time right now, even the past few months, um, I still we stay, stay on a strict schedule um, that all of us uh, ladies on my team, we all follow. Um, it's guided by our coaching staff and, and all staff members. Um, so a typical day is um, two training sessions a day. Um, there can be a lifting session that's uh, three times a week uh, and extra cardio sessions, um, little naps here and there. I'm getting older, so those are important. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and just some downtime. And um, since the um, since COVID, uh, we've actually implemented um, video sessions um, twice a week sometimes three times a week with um, the whole team um, and then just small pockets of us um, in small groups with the, the team um, to do team building, team bonding, um, and just really make sure that we're staying connected. So um, it's a misconception that, you know, during COVID, um, you know, that we're not doing very much. We're very much very busy and keeping on track for our goal, um, to, you know, to do very well on the international stage in, uh, in Tokyo. Yeah, that's incredible that you have been able to continue your training throughout this time. And it sounds like you're still getting lots of opportunity to stay connected with your teammates. Yes, for sure. We have a few more questions that are coming in now from campers. Lucas is asking, were you able to socialize with players from other countries while attending international tournaments? Yes, absolutely. That's a major part of, um, you know, traveling internationally with sports. You get to know so many different people um, from all over the world. And it's so amazing. Like that, it's an amazing experience to, um, you know, meet people and see how they do things. Like, you know, it's not always the same. And um, it's so, it's really cool to stay connected with them and uh, see how they, they run basketball in, in their countries and, what they do in their daily lives and daily environment. Yeah, that's so cool to be exposed to so many different people from different countries yeah. and see like how they train and live yeah. their life. And our next question is from Katie and she's asking in wheelchair basketball, um, do you use a manual wheelchair and can you play wheelchair basketball in an electric wheelchair? Um, so for me, we like our national teams, we don't play in electric wheelchairs. Um, we just play in a sport specific um, basketball chair. Um, so it's all of our chairs um, at that level is custom to us, much as um, some of our everyday wheelchairs are. Um, we have sport specific um, basketball chairs that are custom to our, our needs. Okay, thanks. That's really cool that they're custom to your needs. Yeah, absolutely. And campers, do you have any final questions for Melanie before we wrap up? Just give them a moment to type. Oh, yeah. another question came in from Sarah. She's asking, when you travel internationally, how accessible is it in other countries or on aircrafts? That is a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, it, it depends on the country. Um, it depends on a, a lot of our tournaments um, are, are in major cities, but sometimes they're not. And it becomes kind of a, a little bit tricky, um, you know, renting buses, being able to fit all the chairs in the, in the buses, um, um, airports, I think, because I have traveled so much that, you know, I just figured out what works best for me. Um, but that looks completely different in different countries and their, their policies, their procedures are quite different than here in Canada. And it's just kind of um, getting acquainted with their, their rules, their, their regulations, um, and just respecting that um, other countries just do things differently. 
and finding that kind of middle ground of, you know, what will work for us as a team when we're traveling, what works for the individuals. Um, so it's just kind of make sure to be a little bit respectful of other people's um, roles um, in different countries, but um, also making sure that you advocate so that it works for you. Yeah, that's very cool to hear. Yeah, it's definitely important to advocate for yourself and your teammates while also taking into account like the countries, mm -hmm. their general like customs. Yes, because honestly, I'll, I'll add to that very quickly if I, if I can. Yeah. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so for example, hotels, um, you know, we, we have people that are um, staff members for Wheelchair Basketball Canada that are doing their job and booking, you know, hotels for our teams, our men and women's teams. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes what they, other countries think is accessible um, is not accessible to um, us here and we think everything's okay. And then we get to the country and then we realize, oh, well, their hotel rooms are, you know, very, very tiny and you can hardly fit a very small wheelchair in that room. Or I've gone to, I won't say what country, but I've gone to yeah. countries where, um, you know, we get into a hotel room and the bathroom is actually um, up some stairs in the room. And that's their accessible rooms. Wow. So it's very tricky and very interesting what they believe is accessible. Yes. Yeah. And I can imagine that that would be frustrating, especially after a long travel day to get to what you thought was an accessible hotel room. And then it's not at all. Yes. But we have to realize that, you know, that's just right now. That is how some countries function. Um, that's their um, normal. And um, it's just, once again, advocating um, for, you know, what we need. Um, but also, once I, like I, I said earlier, ad adapting to your environment. So once we're there, we're there. We learn how to adapt to it um, because we don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you've learned a lot from traveling to all of yeah. these different countries. For sure. And our last questions from Arda are... Is there a difficult part of your career that is hard or something that you need more practice with? Yes, absolutely. So um, I am not, I'm putting this out in the world. It's okay, everybody knows. Um, I am not the best um, shooter in, in the world. I struggle with um, shooting, um, taking shots. And um, yeah, that is my biggest um, weakness in wheelchair basketball. Um, so that is something that I, um, I've been working on since after I've had my shoulder surgery. Um, yeah, just being able to identify your weaknesses and, and really work on those. Don't, this is another tip. Don't shy away from your weaknesses, identify them and come up with goals on and strategies on how to work on them. Never shy away from your weaknesses. It's only going to make you stronger. Yeah. That's such a good piece of advice because I find a lot of people have the tendency to avoid their weaknesses, but if you're able to recognize it and work on it, and it makes Absolutely. you so much better at whatever your career yeah. is or whatever that weakness has to do with. Yeah, it's very difficult to, you know, admit that you're not so strong in some area, but you know what? That's everybody. Everybody has strengths. Everybody has weaknesses and that's okay. You just have to accept them and, you know, find strategies on how to improve on them. Yeah, it takes a lot. We're not looking for perfection. We're just looking for improvement. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just checking the YouTube chat one more time and we have reached the end of our camper questions. Okay. So I want to thank you so much, Melanie, for coming on and talking with us and our campers and thank you so much campers for signing on and asking all of these wonderful questions. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Do you have anything to add Cheryl? No, I think we're good. Thanks so much for doing this, Melanie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, it's been a pleasure. Um, like I said, Easter Seals um, has, you know, played a part in where I am today. So um, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And we have lots of campers saying thank you in our YouTube chat to you.